as uh, you know, as a as a ninth grade boy, I remember going on a um, a youth group retreat, and this uh, retreat was focused on well, let's just say uh, the birds and the bees and saving pollination for marriage, right? So to say. And uh, anyway, the goal of the retreat was just to get us to start. Maybe we should do this here with our teenagers. That would be fun. Um, but the goal of the retreat was to get us to start thinking about, you know, healthy relationships with the opposite sex. So um, the leaders asked us all kinds of questions. One they asked, they said, um, you know, what qualities and values would you look for in a future spouse? And so as you can imagine, the uh, answers were rather teenagerish. Right, um, you know, uh, nice teeth, uh, a six pack, you know, <laughs> six pack, <laughs> nice eyelashes, dark hair, blonde hair, have to be shorter than me, you know, uh, loves the backstreet boys, you know, loves long walks on the beach. I don't know, it was a very teenager ish, right? Um, but me, uh, being the very wise, mature ninth grade boy that I was, I skipped by all that stuff. And my answer was, I want somebody who is independent, confident in who they are. Kid you not. So about five years later, when I was in college, I met this girl who embodied that. (laughs) And she's sitting right there. (laughs) Yes, it's wild how things come along. And seriously, if you know Gwen, um, her spirit of confidence really is a special thing. I, I, really, I really think that one of my favorite qualities I, uh, about her, really, she's very confident. You know, we usually don't talk about confidence in church settings. We think it's a bad word, you know, confidence. How can you be confident? We're supposed to be miserable, right? <laughs> uh, no, but uh, the right kind of confidence is a good thing. It's a good thing. When you go and you have to get surgery, What do you want to hear the surgeon say? Hopefully this goes okay. I don't know. I've been thinking about it a lot. I'm a little worried about it, but I think it'll be okay. That's not good. You want your surgeon to be confident when he's going to operate on you, right? Um, Same thing as a musician. You know, the great musicians are confident that they can play the solo. Same with athletes. Uh, the The best athletes are confident. I mean, Michael Jordan... I mean, isn't that what made him the greatest basketball player ever? His, his confidence, Tiger Woods, confidence, right? And as Christians, it's a good thing for us to be confident in our faith. Amen. It's a good thing for us to be confident in our salvation. This is a good thing. I used to listen to a lot of Christian rap when I was in ninth grade. Um, now I listen to a lot of kids bop. Um, Oh, that's, that's nasty stuff, kids bop. But anyway, um, I used to listen to this song um, by this guy named Andy, Andy Minio, and he did a song once called Cocky, and it repeats it over and over again. He says, some say I'm cocky, I just know that God got me. Some say I'm cocky, I just know that God got me. His point was that confidence in faith is a good thing. Confidence in who you are in Jesus is a good thing. And yet so often we struggle with having confidence in our faith. Um, When I was the youth pastor here, um, we used to have these nights where we would do these things called panels. And we would give the teens an opportunity to ask questions and ask me and, and the leaders any questions that they wanted to ask. And as you can imagine, we got some interesting questions, but um, one of the most frequent questions that we got over the years was, how do I know that I'm saved? I don't know I'm saved, you know, because I mess up a lot, I struggle a lot, so, you know, is it real? Can I know that I'm saved? Um, Teenagers ask that question a lot, but I also think that you probably do too, if you're honest with yourself. How do I know that I'm saved? It's a great question to answer because it's a good thing to be confident. It's called blessed assurance, right? Blessed assurance. It's a good thing because when you don't have confidence in your faith, you are easy prey to fear. 
you will easily be crippled in fear in your own head. I got to pick on the younger generation. You, I mean, I know I'm not that old, but the younger generation, but let me, you guys are always in your head, constantly in your head. You, and it's because frankly, I think maybe you may be paralyzed in fear. You're paralyzed in fear. Confidence, though, is a good thing. Confidence drowns out fear, and that's all of us. Confidence is a good thing. And here's the bottom line. The Christian who is confident in their faith, confidence in, uh, confident in their salvation is simply more effective than one who's not. <laughs> right? I mean, if you are confident in what Jesus has done for you, you will bear even more fruit, as we will talk about Today, So today, my goal is to help you all in this room, whatever age you are, to develop a more confident and assured faith. So I originally preached this message back in July 2015, and it's called A Soldier Held Captive. A Soldier Held Captive. Now, before I start, I just want to say that I know that I referenced Gwen earlier. She is not the soldier held captive captive okay she is with me by her own free will i know it's hard to believe but she is with me on her own free will i don't have anything weird in my house you know she's there she's just there okay so um you'll get the full meaning of the story later on but she is not the soldier held captive she's not a soldier nor is she held captive okay uh so let's start with a verse from second peter chapter one let's look at this he says therefore brothers right am i right you're not held cap thank you uh thank you therefore brothers be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election for if you practice these qualities you will never fall so again peter he's encouraging us to arrive at the place where we are confident of our calling and election, of our salvation, of, of our faith, because again, it's a good thing to be confident in it, yet many of us struggle with arriving at this place. So I wanna start by asking why? Why do we struggle with this question? Well, here it is, listen. It's because we will inevitably assess our faith, inevitably assess our salvation by looking at what we do or don't do. We will assess our faith by looking at ourselves. In other words, um, John 15, 8, Jesus said, By this my Father's glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my true disciples. So we'll take that to mean we prove to be one of Christ's disciples if we bear much fruit. So if we wanna have confidence and we wanna have assurance in our faith, we should look at the fruit we're bearing to confirm and prove our faith. But here's the problem with that way of thinking. We will inevitably equate our fruit we're bearing, the outward things that come out of us, we will inevitably equate the fruit we're bearing with how we're measuring up to the law, with God's standards. In other words, the, the more we think that we're following the law, the more we think we're meeting God's requirements, we think the more fruit we bear. So we do everything we can to follow the law, so we bear more fruit, right? We all do it. We inevitably will equate the fruit we're bearing with how we're following the law. But the issue with that, the issue with doing that is that we can have no confidence in how we measure up or in how we follow God's law. You can't have any confidence in it. Watch this. By this my father's glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm going to get really real with you right now. I don't know about you. But I guess this verse is good for me some days. Yeah, some days, some days I feel like I'm bearing lots of fruit, you know, doing real good. You know, I'm up here preaching. I'm like, you know, 
reading to my kids at night and they said, I love you, dad. And I said, I love you too, kids. And you know, everything's just going great. And I feel like the love of God is just exuding out of my heart some days. But honestly, other days. <laughs> and probably if we're all honest, most days. I look at my life and I think, how in the world can I act like that? <laughs> and have the spirit of God inside of me. How can I keep struggling with that and say that I'm saved, a follower of Jesus? How can I think those thoughts and say that I'm really following God? Am I right? Got real quiet, so either you're horrified that your pastor would say this or you're real with yourself, right? I mean, honestly, some days you're bearing lots of fruit and then you drive down I-95 and you're bearing something else, okay? <laughs> We're all there. And if you don't think you're there, you're the one with the problem, not me. That's just the reality of it. If the only place that I can find confidence and assurance and prove my faith is in myself, I will never, ever, find confidence and I will constantly live in fear because I will never live up to it. I will never live up to God's standards. You will have no confidence at all. And as a matter of fact, when you start looking at yourself and how you're doing and how you're following God and how worthy you've been lately, your confidence will be completely destroyed because the inevitable will happen to you. You know what's gonna happen? You will fail. You will mess up. You will discover that you are falling short. And so when you assess your faith in that way, what happens is when you mess up, you wonder if you actually have any true fruit. When you keep struggling, you think that you're failing to prove yourself as a disciple of Jesus. And when we mess up, you start to wonder those thoughts in your head creep in. When you mess up, am I really a Christian at all? If I keep messing up like this, how can I really be a Christian? And the church doesn't help with this at large. Questioning people's faith is just downright disgusting. I can't do that stuff. When we equate our fruit with how we're following the law, we have no confidence at all, and our confidence is destroyed, completely destroyed. You know, the second message I ever preached is called the long jump. And I use this analogy of trying to measure up to the law like trying to jump the longest jump ever recorded. You know what it was? It was 29 feet. 29 feet, over 29 feet. So is anybody in here right now confident that they can jump over 29 feet and beat the world record for the long jump? Anybody? Hopefully not. Thank you for not raising your hand. So <laughs> you cannot do it. You cannot do it. There should be no confidence in this room that you can jump over 29 feet. The same thing happens when you start equating how you're doing, how you're living, the fruit that's coming out of you with how good you're following the law. You should no confidence. You should have no confidence. If you understand the full picture of the law's demands, if you understand the, 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 the God's standard, God's law, you should have no confidence in yourself, in your ability to meet it. That's the point. You can't get there on your own. So why do we keep looking at ourselves as proof of our faith? It makes no sense. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. So what does this mean? Well, again, if you want to have confidence and assurance in your faith, stop looking at yourself. Stop looking at your fruit. Listen to me, this is important. You do not bear fruit to gain confidence in your faith. It's not how it works. You gain confidence in your faith to bear more fruit. Did you catch that? 
you don't bear fruit to gain confidence in your faith. The point of you bearing fruit for God is not to look at it and say, look how great I'm doing. That's not the point of it. You gain confidence in your faith. You pursue confidence in your faith so that you will bear more fruit. See, we inevitably equate the fruit we bear with how we're following the law. The more we follow the law, the better we're doing, the more fruit that we're going to bear. But fruit doesn't come through how much we're following the law. Law following, rules following doesn't bear fruit. It doesn't. Fruit comes through living in the gospel. That is how you bear more fruit. Not doing more, trying harder, being better. That's fake fruit. (laughs) You bear real fruit by, in John 15, in this context, he's talking about abiding in him, right? It's, It's by living in the gospel where we bear more fruit. You'll find no confidence in your faith at all if you're constantly comparing yourself to how you're measuring up with God's standards. But listen to me, you will find all the confidence that you'll ever need by just simply living in the gospel. So you are ready to find some confidence today? Oh uh, yeah, are you ready for this? You want some of the confidence? Yeah, all right, let's do it. This is one of the most beautiful truths that I've ever unlocked for myself personally, and I hope that um, it will help you too. So. Um, I want to look at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. It says, and you were dead in the, remember that word, dead, say dead. 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 You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived, all of us in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he has loved us, even when we were what? Dead. In our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ by effort you have been, no, by grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. This verse is like a cornerstone of our faith, really it is. And it tells, they, they tell us about our original spiritual state, which is dead, dead. Our original spiritual state, according to Ephesians chapter two, is this, and you were dead, in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. In our original spiritual state, you have no inclination, no desire, no thirst, no yearning, no genuine affection for Christ at all. Zero, how can you? You're dead, (laughs) you're dead. For you resident theologians out there, this term is called total depravity. You're dead. You don't have any inclination for Jesus. Your original spiritual state is dead. But the hope found in these verses tells us that even when we were dead, God made us alive. (laughs) In other words, we are called by the Spirit of God. We are called out of death and into life. Think of Lazarus. We're just like Lazarus. He was dead. His heart wasn't beating a little bit. He wasn't holding on by a thread. He was dead. The King James Version says he stinketh much. That's what it says. He was that dead. He was starting to smell, okay? He was dead. But how did Jesus make him alive? Lazarus, come out. He called him out of death and into life. And it was all Jesus, all him. He said, come alive, and he was made alive. So tuck that in your back pocket and remember that. We'll come back to it. Remember that. He made him alive, called him out of death and into life. Now, here's where the whole confidence thing comes in, all right? I have three questions for you to answer. Three questions. And I want you to be honest with yourself in answering these three questions. 
So if we answer them, I think you're gonna find confidence. If you're honest with yourself, you gotta be honest, it's the only catch, okay? You ready, you ready for the questions? All right, here we go. First one, do you love Jesus perfectly? No, I hope you said no. See, this question is a law question because it shows you that you don't measure up to the perfection of God's law and God's standards. Do you love Jesus perfectly? Of course not. You should, you should see very quickly that you, you fall way short of loving Jesus perfectly. I mean, you have deficiencies, you disobey, you sin, you struggle, you fail, you don't come to church every week. I'm looking at you online, right? You know. <laughs> Oh, it's a nice day, okay, how's the beach, everybody, yeah, whatever. You don't love Jesus perfectly or you would be here. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Enjoy the beach. I'll be joining you soon. Uh, anyway, um, you don't love Jesus perfectly. None of us here do. Okay, here's the next question. Do you love Jesus as much as you ought to? No, I know I don't. I know you don't either. See, once again, this is a law question. It, 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 it puts yourself in focus to see how you're doing. And back to what we talked about before, this is like equating the fruit in our lives to how we're measuring up and how we're following God's law and, and what we're doing for God. Do you love Jesus as much as you ought to? No way. Because this question, it should be making you think about all the things you should be doing, all the other fruit you should be bearing, all the things where you are falling short currently and not loving Jesus as much as you ought to. And, it, and you know, unfortunately, this is where a lot of messages stop, right? And they go wrong because now it's time for the pastor to tell you to pick it up. Yeah, now it's time for me to tell you, here's what you should do to start loving him more. You need to do this and you need to do that. And if you, do, uh, if you don't do what God says, maybe you don't really love him and I'm gonna heap guilt, on, he'll heap guilt on you now and shame on you and you need to love him more. Amen. Get me a bucket, I can't stand that stuff. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. So I could talk about how we're all as a church the next week gonna prove how we're, you know, Jesus' disciples and how we're gonna do more, try harder, or be better. That would be a very depressing conclusion to the message. Amen. It would, because you would all inevitably go out and not do it. I mean, come on, let's be real here. You don't love Jesus as much as you ought to and no arm twisting of mine is gonna make you do it. You, you don't, I don't, I don't. That would be a depressing, guilt-ridden, shame heaping on, do more, try harder, be better conclusion. But if you've been going here enough, you know that that's not the conclusion ever. You go to Reach Church. Amen. There's no guilt and there's no shame here. So I have one more question for you, and it's the most important one, and it's this. Do you love Jesus at all? Mm. Do you love Jesus at all? See, that's a different kind of question than the first two, isn't it? There's no measuring stick. There's no measuring rod. And this question drives all the religious people crazy because they wanna feel like they're better than everybody else. But there is no better than everybody else. When you just answer the question, do you love Jesus at all? There's no measure. You can't point to what you've done or what you didn't do or how much more devoted you are to God than that guy over there. It's not concerned with the quality or the amount of people's fruit. It's question simple. It's just simply, do you love Jesus at all? all, at all. And it's the most important question. Because if you can say yes, if you can just honestly answer, I can't answer it for you, but if you can answer that question as yes in your heart, if there is any level of love and affection toward Jesus in your heart at all, is it possible for a dead person to have any love for Jesus at 
all? No. Dead hearts don't love. Listen to me. A love for Jesus can only come from the Holy Spirit of God calling you out of your original spiritual state of dead and into life. So that means, listen to me, if you have any love for Jesus at all, you might be struggling, your life might be filled with mistakes and doubt and shame and whatever, but if you have any love for Jesus at all, that is a miracle. It's a miracle. It is not natural for us to have a love for Jesus. It's a miracle. If you love Jesus at all, that can only be explained by the Holy Spirit of God awakening you and taking residence in you. Oh, you might be running away. You might be on your way to the pig pen. But God will always call you back because he takes residence in you. That's why if you can honestly answer that question, I don't love Jesus perfectly. I don't love him as much as I ought to. Oh, but I love him. If you can honestly answer that question, you can only say that by the power of God inside of you. And that Holy Spirit of God isn't going anywhere. He doesn't quit on you. It is God who establishes with us with you in Christ. Not you. You didn't do anything to be caught out of death and into life. It's God who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us. And look, and who has put his seal on us and given us his spirit in our heart as a guarantee. It's a guarantee the Holy Spirit isn't going anywhere. It's a guarantee. So where do we find our confidence? The Holy Spirit alone. That's it. That's the only place to look for your confidence. Not in how you're measuring up, not in how good you're doing, not in what you do or don't do, and not if you're struggling. Hey, I've been crucified with Christ. All that stuff doesn't matter. It's no longer I who live. It's Kim who lives in me. That's where I find my confidence. In the Holy Spirit of God alone. That's it. So look at the verse again. By this, my Father's glorified, that you bear much fruit and so prove to me my disciples. Fruit doesn't come through how much we follow the law. Law following doesn't produce fruit. This fruit that Jesus is speaking of comes through abiding in him. It comes through living in the gospel. Because it is finished, you are free from the impossible burden of having to earn God's love and acceptance. Because it is finished, there is nothing you can ever do or fail to do that will tempt God to leave you, forsake you, or stop loving you. Because it is finished, you cannot sin beyond the coverage of God's forgiveness. Because it is finished, the sins you can't forget, God doesn't remember. Because it is finished, you are not defined by your worst moments or your greatest accomplishments, your struggles or your successes, your strengths or your weaknesses. You are defined by who you belong to. Because it is finished, you can talk truthfully about the worst parts of you without being afraid of other people's disapproval because the only approval that ultimately matters is God's and you already have it. Because it is finished, you can endure rejection from others because you will never have to endure rejection from God. Because it's finished, you can freely admit when you're wrong because your value isn't dependent on being right, but rather on the righteousness of Jesus that covers you. 
Because it's finished, God loves you unconditionally, and that means you're free from needing anybody else to like you. Because it's finished, you can love others without needing them to love you back. Because all the love you ever need, you already have. Because it's finished, who you ultimately are has nothing to do with you. Your identity is firmly anchored in Jesus' performance, not yours. His record, not yours. You are not what you do or don't do. You are what Jesus has done for you. That's who you are. And because it is finished, we can join our voices with the song of heaven in Revelation chapter 5 and say we are not worthy but the lamb who was slain is worthy. And by the grace of his saving death, we are what we are, beloved sons and daughters of God, because it is finished. Now that, oh, that's some confidence right there. Because it's finished, all of those things bring you extra level, unordinary, supernatural confidence because it's not based in who you are it's not based in what you do or don't do it is completely based in what jesus has done for you and church if you can say in your heart that you love jesus at all that confidence is yours it is yours in christ jesus that blessed assurance that it is finished is yours you just got to live in it and if you do you will bear much fruit much fruit i stole that little because it's finished from uh our friend tullian by the way just to uh for copyright issues okay well i didn't write it just want to let everybody know okay but that's that is like their church's thing man and it's so good because that is where we find our confidence By living in, it is finished. By living in the gospel, that is confidence. Now, I want to end this message with a story, okay? Here's a story. In in World War II, there was a Japanese soldier named Hiru Onada, and he was stationed on a small island in the Philippines. And in early 1945, he received his uh, marching orders from his commander. He said, The commander said, stay and fight, stay and fight. Well, you know, if you know your world history, later in 1945, Japan surrendered. So many of his fellow soldiers, you know, they they went home, they were captured, or maybe even they died. But Hiru stayed on the island where he was stationed, and he just kept sticking to his orders, stay and fight. Soon enough, he, he started to find leaflets proclaiming that the war's over. He just thought this was enemy propaganda to get him to quit. So he stayed in the island, stuck to his orders, stay and fight. He built bamboo huts. He pilfered rice and and other food from a nearby village, killed cows for meat. He was tormented by this tropical heat, by rats, by mosquitoes. He just kept patching his uniform and kept his rifle in working order just in case he would have to fight. And so Hiru stayed on that island, fighting World War II, until 1974, 29 years after his country surrendered. He was finally found by a Japanese student who heard about his story, and the Japanese student went to find him to tell him that the war was over. The student came and said, the war is over. Haru didn't even believe him, and he wasn't even convinced to leave the island. He didn't leave the island until his former commander actually came and found him and told him himself that the war was over. So he left that island 29 years after World War II ended, now at 52 years old. He was stuck on that island fighting a battle that was over for 29 years. You know what he was? He was a soldier held 
captive. Or do you not know, brothers, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives. For a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives. But if her husband dies, she's released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law. And if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead. Look, in order that we may bear fruit for God. For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are released. You're released from the law, having died to that which held us captive so that we serve in the new way of the spirit and not in the old way of the written code. I know, I don't even wonder, I know that there are many out there in this room, watching now, watching later, I know that there are many soldiers held captive out there today. And you are bound up by a lack of confidence in your faith because you are bound up by the crushing weight of the law's condemnation towards you. You're bound up by things like you're a fraud, you're a joke, you're not good enough, you don't do enough, you could never measure up, you don't love God enough, you have to do more, try harder, be better. You are a soldier held captive to all of those things. Well, listen up, soldier. I came to give you a new set of marching orders this morning, okay? Guess what? You're right. You're not good enough. You're not. You don't do enough. Never will. You can never measure up. You don't love Jesus perfectly or as much as you ought to. But that is exactly why he came to die for you. That's why he did it. So, hey, soldier, time to get off the island. You don't belong there anymore. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free. It set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. That is why, that is why I am confident that he who began a good work in me will bring it to completion. I'm sealed. You're sealed by the promise of the guarantee of the Holy Spirit. If you can answer that question today, do you love Jesus at all? If there's any, you're a miracle. And that Holy Spirit is in you. He is in you. And you just need to stop being bound up by the law and live in the freedom of what he's called you to. And if you don't have a love for Jesus in your heart today, I hope you listen real closely to everything I just said. It's not about you. It's all about what he's done for you. This is a free gift to And all you have to do is receive it. He will bring it to completion on the day of Christ Jesus. So, all right, soldiers, stand up and receive your marching orders. Come on, stand up. You're all soldiers, right? 
Get off the island. Amen. Get off. Amen. It's finished. Amen. He paid it all. Woo! What are you doing standing there trying to prove yourself anymore? It is over. You're a soldier held captive no longer. As the hymn says, on then, Christian soldiers, on to victory. Hell's foundations quiver at the shout of praise. Brothers, lift your voices loud, your anthems raise. Onward then, ye people, join our happy throng. Blend with ours your voices in the triumph song. Glory, laud, and honor unto Christ the King. This through countless ages, men and angels sing. Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to war with the cross of Jesus going on before. Get off the island. I want to pray a prayer of freedom over you right now. God, I pray that you would do as you said, that you would come to set the captives free. I want to pray right now for those who are here, for those who are listening, that they would be released from that condemnation, that they're not good enough, that their mistakes have caused them to not love you more. All of those lies, God, would you erase that? And would you speak freedom to every heart here that they would leave the island of condemnation and take hold of the freedom that you've called them to live in. God, we are your servants. We are your soldiers. But God, I pray that you would release us from any captivity that still remains in our hearts, that we would be freed to live in your gospel. And by doing so, God, we would bear much fruit. All of these things, God, we ask in your name. And all of God's people said, amen.